Bigfoot is uh, a part of the innovation that's happening in uh, this uh, ecosystem. It's going to change healthcare beyond recognition. Uh, you're going to hear about a lot of amazing things over uh, these couple days. However, I think we are pretty distinctive in some fundamental ways, uh, starting with the uh, who. Uh, we are a company a a affected by the disease that we're trying to treat more effectively. Uh, this is also a space in which the patients themselves have actually developed and tested and today use the most advanced systems for treating the disease. The patients have done that. They're way ahead of the companies. So I think that is interesting for a number of reasons. We'll return to it as we talk about what we're doing. But I want to frame what problem we're trying to solve. Insulin requiring diabetes. Uh, people whose lives are dependent upon insulin to live on a daily basis. This is type 1 diabetes, but it's unfortunately an increasing uh, percentage of type 2. This is what it means. Uh, you have a drug which is extraordinarily dangerous, meaning if you give too much of it, you can kill a person. Uh, it is a drug that must be administered in no fixed dose. Doctor can't tell you how much to take. You're making decisions throughout the day, multiple decisions across the day. You're using complicated diagnostic and drug delivery devices that are in all uh, likelihood misconfigured and being used improperly because consumers don't read instructions and we don't listen to our doctors. Uh, and then uh, all of this is happening under the care of a primary care provider. Most people with type 1 diabetes in this country are treated by primary care providers who weren't trained uh, in endocrinology and have very little understanding of the disease and they write prescriptions for needles and insulin and sometimes the gadgets that test glucose and deliver insulin. Um, uh, it's even worse if you go to uh, look at insulin requiring type 2. So I'm interested in this because my son has this stupid disease. Uh, I uh, found myself in 2002 after a background in some uh, tech companies that had far less important missions, uh, sitting before an endocrinologist in New York City, a lovely woman uh, who gave us the state of the art, which was that glucometer and some needles, uh, some vials of insulin, and literally a hand-drawn sliding scale, if this, do that, if that, do this, and then sent us off in the world after a very stern lecture that uh, giving too much of this drug could literally kill my seven-year-old son, uh, and if nobody was around to uh, intervene, uh, that could end very badly. Uh, if I gave him too little over time of this drug, all sorts of nasty things like amputation and blindness and kidney failure were likely to happen. Uh, but like I said, no fixed dose, a lot of decisions. You need to learn how to do it. This is a very simple equation, which actually is, is too simplistic, but it's a, enough for making the point. Every person who gives himself an insulin injection or insulin infusion has to figure out where they are relative to where they should be in terms of glucose concentration. So you do a test, you pick a target, uh, you subtract, you figure out how sensitive your body is to insulin at that particular moment of the day, which is going to change within the day and across days and then over time as well. Uh, and then you are going to figure out what you're eating, the carbohydrate content of the meal uh, that even by law could vary by 15% if you're looking at packaged foods. And if you're looking at a slice of pizza that you got at the uh, corner, uh, good luck. Uh, and then uh, you're going to figure out how much per carb uh, you're going to give an insulin and, and come up with that magic number and inject yourself or uh, infuse yourself if you're using an insulin pump. And it's even worse than that because some of the underlying variables in this equation are constantly changing. Uh, this is too hard. Well, today we, we have uh, this. This is an insulin pump that represents the state of the art of the technology. This is as good as it gets. Uh, it is a complicated medical device that was designed by people who uh, do a great job of delivering things to clinical environments where you have trained medical professionals, you have people who read manuals, who do continuing education, uh, and have certain standards for usage of the equipment. Uh, a consumer is no such thing. A uh, consumer does not listen to the doctor, does not read the manual, and they do amazingly creative things that you could never imagine uh, with the devices that you give them. Uh, this is not a fit for the customer. And the customer is the person making those decisions and living with the disease. This is the problem that we're solving at Bigfoot. Because even with those technologies, people are doing really badly. This is uh, across age groups, a representation of the best performing cohort in the country. These are the people who are seeing the endocrinologist, not the primary care provider at the top 77 clinics in the United States. 
Uh, these are the HbA1c's, the mean that you use to measure glucose uh, 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 for people with diabetes historically. And if you look at the ADA's recommended, uh, pretty much everybody is failing to be anywhere near, and uh, people uh, south of 20 are, are failing particularly badly, as you would expect with uh, adolescents and children and families. But let's just take an adolescent that's doing well, or at least looks to be doing well. This is actually uh, data from one of the founders of Bigfoot. Uh, his son at one point had an HbA1c of 6.9, which if you know anything about uh, adolescents and you know anything about type 1 diabetes, this is complete and total victory. Uh, you, you would be very happy, except when you start to look at how that average is derived. Th this is the uh, data that has contributed to that average. And on the extremes, these are all opportunities to go to the emergency room on the high side and the low side, and in fact, this uh, kid has as my son uh, has, unfortunately. So uh, this is uh, 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 a very dangerous disease, one which people, even those who have access to the best doctors, are not doing very well living with. This is the problem we're trying to solve. So Bigfoot. Well, we're inspired by people who have taken this problem into their own hands. You may have heard of this idea of an artificial pancreas. Artificial pancreas is a term for taking an insulin pump and a continuous glucose monitor and creating a feedback loop between the two. A computer to actually do decision support or actually automated dosing in some cases for this very dangerous but life-sustaining drug. Uh, I spent, uh, since my uh, tech entrepreneur days, uh, about uh, 12 years uh, working with nonprofits, uh, culminating in my leadership of the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, uh, funding a lot of proof of concept work to take different insulin pumps, different glucose monitors, tie them together with different approaches or feedback loops. And the answer we got was, it's all better than what people do. We need to get things to the marketplace. But it wasn't happening. And so my co-founder, uh, aka Bigfoot, Brian Maslisch, uh, he took matters into his own hands. He was the first one to literally improve his own medical devices. He did so because he had a wife, uh, Sarah, who uh, had had type 1 diabetes for many decades, but you know, that was her business and she managed it very well. And frankly, he will admit he didn't know a lot about what she lived with on a daily basis and had to put up with. But then when their son was diagnosed, it became a very different picture. Uh, and he said, uh, this is not tolerable. So he literally hacked into an insulin pump, a continuous glucose monitor, created the uh, connectivity bridge between those devices, used a smartphone, and took some uh, work to repurpose his understanding of automated trading algorithms, because his previous career was actually computers which traded stocks and ended up with more money in the bank account at the end of the day than they started with. It turns out that was uh, particularly applicable to, producing, uh, to predicting glucose trends, which he will admit to you are easier to predict than <laughs> the value of stocks at the end of the day. Uh, he hacked into these devices, created a transformative experience using available technologies, his wife and son have been living better, safer, easier lives for now going on five years based on what he was able to do. Admittedly, the smartest guy that I've ever met, but one person taking the existing infrastructure, a smartphone, and actually transforming the lives of his wife and his son. Uh, and today, that system that literally he abandoned working on two or three years ago when we founded Bigfoot is better than anything in the pipeline of any medical device company except for Bigfoot. So innovation's happening in a very interesting way for Bigfoot. And also, we're building a company and introducing ourselves in a quite interesting way. Things seem to be very much out of sequence. Uh, today, we actually have about a quarter of the social media presence of the 800-pound gorilla in the space. Uh, more uh, followers on Facebook, uh, Twitter followers, than companies that have been selling products for, in some cases, a decade. Wow, the world is changing. It's because the patients, and in this case, uh, disease, which has a very big impact on the lives of those patients, these people are leading the revolution, and the community wants to know about it, and it wants to be a part of it. What are we doing? Well, we're just integrating what uh, medical devices do with the rest of our lives. This is the center of our lives. This is where we live now, for good or for ill. Uh, we're connected to everything. We have all these uh, cloud systems and, and smart devices, and they're whirring away trying to improve our lives, except in this space, where the state of the art literally doesn't connect to a smartphone. 
It literally, unless you hack it, does not connect to a smartphone. My son almost died because of this fatal design flaw. Uh, in fact, uh, he had a system which knew he was dying. It told uh, uh, him that he uh, had uh, a glucose level which was uh, literally uh, 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 bottoming out to the point that doesn't sustain life. But uh, he wasn't able to respond because he was already unconscious. We were down the hall in another room. Uh, and it wasn't connected to anything. It couldn't tell us anything. And the only reason he's alive today is because my wife got up in the middle of the night and said, I felt something's wrong. Well, that's not acceptable. It's not acceptable, and we're changing it. So you've got to actually uh, tackle some hard problems in order to do this, though. There's a good reason why medical devices and iPhones aren't uh, tightly bound today. It's a relatively fragile and insecure device from the standpoint of medical devices, which have to work all the time and keep people safe all the time. So you've got to solve a few problems. You've got to tie things together. Uh, today, things that are made by different companies uh, uh, have different uh, 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 ways of communicating to the world and to the consumer, uh, aren't fundamentally secure. You have to actually create this ecosystem. Well, this has been done, right? Um, Apple's done it. Other companies are creating ecosystems. They simplify the experience for the consumer. They actually lower training. Uh, they allow people to leverage data and, and, and live easier. Uh, this is what you got to do for medical device. But all those devices are expensive and time consuming to make. And then you got to test them in clinical trials. This is why this is hard. Class three medical devices, which are a very rare error in terms of medical device, uh, the highest risk uh, devices that exist, the kind of things that are usually surgical robots, uh, uh, things that trained medical professionals are operating in uh, hospitals, uh, except for in this case, you don't get the choice of doing it in the hospital because you're giving yourself this drug all day long. Uh, a class three medical device is a tough thing to develop because it takes a lot of scrutiny, admittedly appropriate, from the FDA. And I can tell you, nobody's really interested in doing it because if you can do with an app in an unregulated sense or you can do with a class one medical device or a 510K at the most, uh, there's a lot of opportunity with relatively little capital investment to, to create some value, but not for this problem. This problem requires you play the highest stakes at the highest level uh, because people's lives are literally dependent upon it. So what do you got to do? You have to tie it all together. You have to have tremendous competency in devices and the embedded software in those devices, tying them together in a secure fashion, building cloud systems. And then the app on the phone is sort of like the cream on the crop. It's what everybody looks at and says, wow, that's the manifestation of the system. But it is actually the easiest thing to do. The other stuff is the hard part. You have to change everything in terms of security for an iPhone that you press a button on, and then it actually doses a drug that, if given in the wrong amount, could kill you. You have to change everything. You have to change how you manufacture the devices themselves. Issue a crypto key at time of manufacture that's only known in the cloud systems. And so when that phone makes a request to connect to that insulin pump, there's only one person in the world in our system that we know should be connecting. And then we create an unbreakable bond between the two. But then since security is not static, it could be hacked if somebody spends enough time. You have to have over-the-air firmware upgrading to propagate out within 24 hours a patch that's actually going to fix any hole that anybody opens up. This is familiar to all of us because it's the way the rest of the world works, but not a medical device. These are hard problems to solve in the context of the FDA, in the context of a life-critical, life-sustaining system. And we've got to move away from hardware. The hardware exists, and it costs hundreds of millions of dollars to develop. Uh, we have bought some, we have licensed some, but fundamentally, you've got to make the system more about bits than atoms, and that requires a smart architecture from the very beginning. What I'm most proud about is the ability to leverage data, uh, not just in real time, but to fundamentally change the economics of developing these businesses. In silico modeling, uh, I, I hear about some of the modeling that's done for some of these biological processes or drugs. That's very, very complicated stuff. Everybody knows about uh, uh, glucose and how it works and insulin pharmacodynetics. It's actually easy to model this stuff, and we've created an engine that does it. And so literally, when we did our clinical trial, we were able to predict in silico our simulations for the 20 random people that we were going to get, kids, adults, big, small, exercise a lot, disease, long time, short time, 164 milligrams per deciliter, both in the in silico modeling and in the trial itself. 
This is a big change that's happening, and it's going to lower costs. It's going to allow people to move more quickly, to test things in computers that don't have to be tested expensively in humans, and to test them better and more robustly. Because you can model 100 million patient days in the cloud in a matter of minutes that would have taken years and years and years of use of any system. And then modeling is mostly about the economics and the outcomes of this stuff. There is huge opportunity here. Uh, and that's what makes it possible for us to do what we're doing. But at the end of the day, um, why I'm doing what I'm doing is my son, Sean. Um, but I think this uh, clinical trial participant was a great example uh, of uh, what inspires me about this space. Uh, she wants to be part of it. She doesn't want it to happen to her. She wants to be a part of the journey. She wants to participate in her own improvement of her life. And we're happy to be on this journey with her. Uh, that's what we're doing at Bigfoot Biomedical, and I'm very pleased to be able to tell you about it today. Thank you. Thank you. you know, amazing, amazing work inspired by your own personal story and lots of folks who are hacking healthcare. Uh, you always get asked on the regulatory constraints, when do you think this will become the norm for type 1 diabetics? Uh, what, when we reach the marketplace. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, unfortunately, the, the uh, investors um, uh, shy away from the big stuff that takes a lot of time and big clinical trials. It'll take us $225 million to launch these products. And we got lucky by buying an asset that somebody else had invested $150 million in for $5 million. So this is big stuff with uh, some significant risk associated with it. And unfortunately, there aren't enough people investing in it right now. Well, if you want to invest, you can find them at the breakout session today. <laughs> and thanks for your great work in the space. Thanks, thanks Jeffrey. All right.